Bangsa kamu yang indah Yang berkembang bekal harpo wangi Tumbuh dan berkembang Respect to the Imam Brothers and sisters Here at Hotel de Palma In Ampang Point Don't forget it's Ampang Point when you come from different parts of the world to stay here, don't go to the other hotel in Malaysia. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. First of all, we are grateful to Surau Nurul Hikmah at Hotel de Palma for kindly agreeing to a switch of topics for tonight. Tonight, we brought forward a topic which was supposed to be delivered later. Tonight's topic is that fascinating topic of dreams and visions in Islam. And you do dream sometimes, don't you? Dreams and visions in Islam. And we also announced tonight the postponement of the lecture which was supposed to take place right here on the 22nd on the Muslim alliance with Rome because I am discovering the subject to be far more complex than I anticipated and my preparations for that lecture I don't have enough time now so I prefer to postpone the lecture until a later date when I'll be more comfortable with the topic. And so dreams and visions in Islam. The forgotten branch of knowledge. Hardly ever do you hear someone speaking on this topic. We chose this topic for tonight because Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu waslam in the month of Rajab had that ru'ya in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the Quran refers to it as a ru'ya <coughs> when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took him on a journey it was not a spiritual experience alone it was the totality of his being on the Isra and Mi'raj and so tonight we return to this vitally important subject of ru'ya, dreams and visions in Islam. And we chose to begin with that verse of Surah to Yunus of the Quran. Yunus, Jonah. The tenth Surah of the Quran. In which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala declares those whom Allah draws close to him befriends them protects them the awliya Allah they live lives in which they will have to experience no fear and no cause for grief <laughs> these are a people who had faith and who also had taqwa the fear of Allah the consciousness of Allah in their heart and for them Allah says for them there is there are good news glad tidings in the life of this world and in the hereafter as well glad tidings and good news for them and when Allah gives his word Allah keeps his word Allah's word never changes when you get glad tidings and good news that's the supreme success 
نبی محمد صلی اللہ تعالیٰ علیہ وسلم in explaining this verse of the Quran said that the Bushra the good news, the glad tidings that come to those who are his faithful servants, Allah's faithful servants that good news and glad tidings, that Mubashira comes as Ru'ya Sadiqa and Ru'ya Saliha good good visions and true visions and good dreams and true dreams and about good dreams and good visions and true dreams and true visions he said something more vitally important for this age that I recognize and you recognize as the age of Dajjal but others don't sadly so you cannot explain the reality of the world today without reference to Dajjal the false messiah if you attempt to do so you are just whistling in the wind that's what I have to say to them any rational person any person of knowledge would know that you cannot explain you cannot penetrate the reality of the world today to explain events which are unfolding constantly and which are also about to unfold events in which the state of Israel and the Zionists and the Anglo-American Judeo-Christian Alliance and NATO are playing a central role you can't do it without reference to Dajjal the false messiah who sees with one eye who has external sight but is internally blind and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to us Surah Al-Kahf of the Quran as the surah paraxilas the surah the only surah with links to Dajjal about which the Prophet himself والسلام, has confirmed recite the first ten recite the last ten verses of surah al kaf and you will get protection from the fitna of Dajjal who sees with one eye this is epistemology the branch of knowledge which studies knowledge and in this surah Allah gives us the answer to the job and he is Khidr alayhi salam and Khidr alayhi salam is the model the model of Islamic scholarship in akhiru zaman the Islamic scholarship which can penetrate and recognize the reality of the world today and which has the capacity to respond to it appropriately that model of a scholarship that man who is the teacher of a prophet is Khidr alayhi salam and he receives knowledge directly from Allah وَعَلَّمْنَاهُ مِنْ لَدُنَّ عِلْمًا there are those who have a methodology and I have to come back to it again and again and again because somehow I'm failing in impressing them I'm failing a methodology which says that there is no more knowledge to come from the Quran and from the ahadith of Prophet Muhammad was other than that which has already been given by the Messenger of Allah and by his companions, the early Muslims. No new knowledge is to come. No new knowledge is to come which can explain whatever is in the Quran and whatever is in the Hadith. And yet, listen to a Hadith that you hardly ever hear 
from the member or outside the member. The Prophet said Sallallahu Ta'ala Alaihi Wasallam Have you ever heard it before? He said Nabuwa and Nabuwa or Prophethood is comprised of 46 different parts the hadith is in Sahih Bukhari Nabuwa or Prophethood is comprised of 46 different parts after me, Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam, nothing remains of prophethood in the world other than one part. Other than one part. There is one part of prophethood still remaining in the world today. Should we not, should we not bow our heads in humility and in Gratitude to Allah Who in his kindness has still left into the world Still left with us in the world One part of prophethood The forgotten path The forgotten part of prophethood That no one talks about Tonight here in the Palma We remind ourselves he said that that one part of prophethood still remaining in the world is a ru'ya sadiqa and a ru'ya saliha. Good dreams and visions and true dreams and visions are the last remaining part of prophethood in the world. How, how can you say that there is no more knowledge to come. That's wrong methodology. The subject is therefore of supreme importance. The Quran itself addresses the subject of dreams and visions. But we need maybe two, three hours to take you through, to take you through all the verses of the Quran pertaining to dreams and visions. We don't have the time to do that, but you got homework to do. Hmm? There are three kinds of dreams or visions. Said Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam. There are those dreams and visions which are good and which are true. And they come from Allah. And if you have such a dream or vision, then you must perform two raka'at salat nafil salatu nafila in gratitude to Allah and then give something in charity to thank Allah and then there are dreams which come from shaitan and these are evil dreams these are nightmares these are tricksters these are dreams of deception and when you have such a dream said the Prophet a dream from shaitan which of course you will have to recognize yourself you don't have time to wake up go to the computer send an email to Sheikh Imran could you kindly tell me whether it is of shaitan <laughs> You will have to recognize it yourself. When you wake up from your sleep, you must turn your head to your left shoulder. Nobody ever told this to me. Nobody ever lectured on this subject to me. I graduated from the Alimi Institute of Islamic Studies without knowing this subject. <laughs> because it wasn't taught. Turn your head to the left shoulder and spit three times without saliva necessarily leaving your mouth and then do not tell that dream to anyone not even to your grandmother and if you do that oh and if you want to go back to sleep 
Then if you were sleeping on your right side, turn to your left side, change. If you do that, if you turn your hand to the left shoulder and spit three times, which is psychologically dispelling, if you restrain yourself from narrating the dream to anyone, then the dream will fade away and will not harm you. And then there is a third kind of dreams. And this is the one which has engaged the attention of Western psychologists like Sigmund Freud and Carl Jung and Alfred Adler and other uh, psychologists, psychoanalysts. And that is the dream that comes from your own heart in which your heart speaks to you. Hmm? dreams from your own nafs. We, we wish we could have taken you tonight through all the dreams of the Quran. Number one, the dream or vision of Ibrahim alayhi salam in which he saw himself sacrificing his son. Number two, number two, the dream of his great-grandson Nabi Yusuf alayhi salam the Prophet Joseph in which he saw the sun the moon and eleven stars bowing down and making sijda before him number three and number four the dreams of the two prisoners whom he met when he was sent to prison Hmm? Sometimes when you are a very handsome man, sometimes you, when you are an extraordinarily beautiful woman, it can create problems, you know. It can create problems. <laughs> so he is in prison. And these two prisoners come to him. And uh, they narrate their dreams to him. The one who said, He's a butler for the king, he serves the king. He said, I saw myself pouring wine for the king. And the other one who is a baker, he said, I saw myself with a basket of bread, loaves of bread on my head, and the vultures were picking for it. And then there is uh, one, two, three, four, number five, the, the king himself, Quran does not say, Fir'aun. Masha'Allah. Meticulous accuracy in the Quran. It does not say Fir'aun. It says King. And you might want to ask yourself why. That's your homework. And the king has a dream. Seven thin cows and seven fat cows. And the thin cows devour the fat cows. Seven ears of corn with the grain still in the husk. And seven ears of corn with no grains on the husk. And uh, then there is the dream of uh, Someone who descended from Yusuf alayhi salam many, many generations later. The mother of Musa alayhi salam who saw, who was given the wahi, the inspiration to put the baby in the basket. Put the basket in the river and Allah then took the baby to where he took the baby. And then there is Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam on the eve of the battle of Badr. And uh, if we are defeated, that's the end. Everything is finished. All the 13 years in Makkah, all the 18 months in Medina, everything will be gone at this moment then communicated which restored morale and then there is the dream 
provision of Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam after the battle of Badr, after the battle of Uhad, after the battle of Khandaq or Al-Ahzab, when the kuffar had given to war all that they could give and they had not succeeded. And you now have a military stalemate and that military stalemate open the door of opportunity political opportunity the Nabi Muhammad والسلام, is given a dream that at a time when we, we are at war with Makkah he saw himself making tawaf around the Kaaba hmm? and so he gets up and he announces I'm going and this led to Hudaybiyah and to what happened after that we don't have the time are these all the dreams in the Quran or is there any more? I believe we have exhausted them but I will have I don't have the time it draws tears to my eyes that I don't have the time to analyze these dreams for you I, I have written a book on dreams in Islam unfortunately we are out of stock all my other books are outside there but not this book but if you go to the internet or you go to my website you can dream you can read the book in which there is an analysis <coughs> of these dreams each one of them a true dream or a true vision can also be one in which you see Prophet Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam he said man ra'ani faqad al haq Whosoever sees me has truly seen me. Whosoever sees me has truly seen me. For shaitan cannot take my form. Hmm? Uh, I will refrain from analyzing this statement as well for purposes of time. Good dreams and true dreams can be dreams of prophets. Good dreams and true dreams can be dreams of Jannah. Sometimes a dream of Jahannam comes your way to wake you up. Like that 17 year old Egyptian boy who was wayward, wasn't listening to his father. When I met him he was working at the United Nations in New York and he sat down with me and narrated his dream. He wasn't performing his salat and he went to sleep and in his sleep he saw a very vast field and he saw multitudes and multitudes of people. But what happened to them? Have they gone mad? He saw them tearing their clothing and tearing their hair and beating their chest and flinging their hands up in the sky and throwing themselves down on the ground men and women, women with no care about whether they expose themselves or not and they're sweating like horses and they're begging and begging and begging Allah for forgiveness and he suddenly realized to his horror that this was judgment day that he was seeing judgment day and that he would have to face the same and when he woke up his entire body was wet the fright was so great and he felt tremendous hunger he could do nothing else but get out of bed go to the shop buy some food and eat it quickly 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 and then back again in the bed as though something was pulling him back into the bed and as he got back in the bed he fell asleep and the dream came back and continued from where it left off he said when I woke up from that day to this day I have never missed I have never missed a salat his life changed 
his life changed. And so a dream, a good dream, can be a wake-up call. A wake-up call from Allah. But good dreams and true dreams are not just dreams and visions of people. No. Dreams and visions can come to those who are struggling in the path of knowledge. Every major scientific discovery in the scientific and technological revolution that we have experienced these last 300, 400 years, every major breakthrough, breakthrough in the scientific and technological revolution has come to a scientist who has planted and planted and planted and then suddenly, 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 insight and an answer comes to him through insight and this is why Allah says in the Quran وَأَلَيْسَ لِلْإِنسَانِ إِلَّا مَا سَعَى you cannot reap if you do not plant the only people I know of who reap without planting are banks how can they reap when they do not plant tell them they are reaping what others are planting they are reaping what others are planting and they will pay a bitter price for that and so you have to struggle you have to struggle if you are to receive this gift of Bushra and in that struggle you go to the Quran and you go to the hadith of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam. and if Allah chooses then Allah can bless you with continuing knowledge that's coming into the world explaining the Quran and explaining the hadith as never before because the time has come for this knowledge to come but when you get good dreams and good visions be careful be careful of this mouth of yours because if you go and start broadcasting it on CNN <laughs> what's going to happen? your dreams and visions are going to dry up dry up so do not tell your dreams and visions to others with pride in your heart that I'm a big man. Secondly, do not tell your dreams and visions to every Tom, Dick and Harry. لَا تَكْسُسْ رُؤْيَاكَ عَلَىٰ إِخْوَتِكَ فَيَكِيدُ لَكَ كَيْدَ says Yaqub alayhi salam to his son Yusuf. Do not tell your dream your vision to your brothers even though they are the sons of a prophet of Allah if they hear this vision of yours they're going to plan to respond to it with evil and so dreams and visions which are from Allah good dreams and good visions you do not tell to everyone you share it only with those who love you who will not harm you and those who have been blessed by Allah with the knowledge of the interpretation of dreams and vision the dream or the vision which comes to you from Allah communicating information does not necessarily have to come in a way which is plain because Allah in the Quran tells us that the verses of the Quran are of two kinds there are those verses which are the heart of the Quran Ummul Kitab which are muhkama plain and clear you don't have to send an email to Sheikh Imran could you kindly interpret this dream for me <laughs> plain and clear but Allah in his wisdom in his wisdom has chosen to also send in the Quran verses which are not muhkamat verses which have to be subjected to ta'wil 
Ta'weel. Ta'weel means interpretation and they are called mutashabihat. They are verses which have to be interpreted. And uh, in Surah Yusuf of the Quran, وَكَذَلِكَ يَجْتَبِيكَ رَبُّكَ وَيُعَلِّمُكَ مِنْ تَأْوِيلِ الْأَحَادِيثِ إلى آخر الآية It is Allah, it is Allah who blesses you with this knowledge how to interpret dreams and visions تأويل الأحادث It is not taught in the International Islamic University in Gumba it's not taught in any university. No. No teacher can communicate this knowledge to any student. No. Imam Muhammad ibn Sirin's book is very nice to read, but that does not give you the meaning of your dream. No. The only way you can get knowledge of the interpretation of dreams is if Allah gives that knowledge to you, Allah blesses you with that knowledge. The knowledge which comes from true dreams and true visions has a status which must be respected. It is the last remaining part of prophethood in the world today. Before we proceed to the dreams which come from shaitan, I would like to give you a few examples and uh, if Ibrahim Hussein is boasting Allah will take away whatever little knowledge he has. If Imran Hussein speaks with pride Allah will surely take away whatever little knowledge he has. Having said that, here is a verse of the Quran in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives a command بَعْدَعُوذِ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا O you who have faith in Allah لا تتخذوا اليهود والنصارى أولياء Do not take the Jews and do not take the Christians as your friends and allies Stop Go to the respected books of tafsir and read what is there as explanatory. Tafsir is explanation of this verse of the Quran. Read it all. And now listen to what I am asking. Is Allah speaking about all Jews and all Christians? Or is he speaking about some Jews and some Christians? An important question. When I go to the rest of the Quran, it becomes clear without doubt that Allah could not be speaking about all Jews and all Christians. No. For example, in Surah Al-Ma'idah, وَلَتَجِدَنَّ أَقْرَبَهُمْ مَوَدَّةً لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا الَّذِينَ قَالُوا إِنَّا نَصَارًا That you will most certainly find in time to come those who will be closest and dearest to you in love and affection and compassion will be those who say we are Christians. We have with us here tonight, I can't mention his name for security purposes, but he is a, he's a Frenchman. He's not Muslim. He tra he's traveling from Southeast Asia to France. And he discovered about this lecture on the internet and he stopped over in Malaysia to come to this hotel to attend this lecture tonight. And so you don't say all Christians are enemies and write them off. And you cannot be friends with a Christian. How foolish will we have in our midst tonight a Christian who has acted in this way? If Allah is not speaking about all Jews and all Christians, was she a Christian woman? The white American woman who went to Palestine. What was her name? 
Richard Corey, Rachel, Raquel Corey. She went to Palestine to protest against the Zionist destruction of the homes of the Palestinians. And she went before a tractor which was going to demolish a home and stood up in front of the tractor to prevent it from demolishing the home. And the Zionist who has the heart of a beast drove the tractor over her body and killed her. Is that woman your enemy? <laughs> Is the Quran saying you cannot be friends with such people? What nonsense. Well then if Allah is not speaking about all Jews and all Christians, which Jews and which Christians? I ask this question. And when I ask this question, the answer is right there in the words which follow. Allah is saying, That's the answer to the question. Do not, do not take such Jews and such Christians as your friends and allies Ba'aduhum awliya ubad Who themselves are friends and allies of each other The Quran is anticipating the emergence of a Judeo-Christian alliance Judeo-Christian friendship and alliance When that Jewish-Christian friendship and alliance emerges Do not be friends with them that Jewish friendship alliance was never there when the books of Tafsir were written. It's only in this modern age that it has now emerged. It is the Anglo-American Judeo-Christian alliance which has, which has embraced the Zionism, which has NATO as its military arm. Hmm? Allah is saying, do not be friends and allies of these Jews and Christians. And whosoever takes them as friends and allies, as the so-called Mujahideen in Libya, and so-called Mujahideen in Syria, they are angry with me. I know they are angry with me so-called Mujahideen who entered into an alliance with NATO to overthrow the Libyan government. I am not a supporter of the Libyan government. What absolute nonsense. I have never been a supporter of the Libyan government or the, or the Syrian government. What rubbish. Absolute rubbish. I'm talking about your alliance which is prohibited by Allah and you would not listen to me. Here is an interpretation of the verse of the Quran which was never given before. And because it was never given before, this is the first time it was given, they will not accept it. They close their eyes, they close their ears, they close every single thing to this interpretation of the Quran. Why? Because it was never given before. New knowledge cannot come. How sad it is. So when new knowledge comes, from the Quran, Allah blesses you with, with that new knowledge. Remember, this is not the Quran, this is not the Hadith. So this does not have the authority of the Quran and Hadith. No. This is a vision, this is a, this is an insight. And so when you have this insight, when this knowledge comes through this medium, the last remaining part of prophethood in the world, you simply communicate it to the people and they have the choice if they wish to accept it or if they wish not to accept it. How much time left for the Azan? No. Not yet. We turn now to the second kind of dreams and visions and they are from Shaitan, from Iblis, from Satan and they have a specific purpose. <laughs> Their purpose is to make your life miserable. Their purpose is to try to deceive you. It is to try to misguide you. Hmm? <laughs> like, 
<laughs> you have a dream or a vision and you are walking down the road Pasap, Pasamalam in the night market and there are very bright lights in the night market and there were some youngsters playing football and you, you stop by with your bag with your groceries your market stuff and you're looking at them playing football but then you notice what what, wait, wait a minute, they're playing football with my head. When you see them playing football with your head, you get such a terrifying fright. You could have a heart attack. You sweat. Hmm? You wake up terrified. And this is called a nightmare. And Shaitan's purpose is to make your life miserable. And as he sees you responding in a miserable way, he is so happy, he is laughing his head off. From there where you can't see him. But Dreams and visions which come from Satan can have more dangerous implications. Uh, you, you, you got married, mashallah. If, if you're a young man and you're not married, let me know after the lecture because I have many, many daughters. <laughs> you got married, mashallah. And Allah gave you a lovely girl as your wife. She's in hijab. She's not bareheaded. No. She covers. She does not reveal the charms that Allah gave to her. No. She is modest. Mashallah. She's shy. The essence of a woman is being shy and bashful not like Uncle Sam's daughters no <laughs> who have lost all shyness all bashfulness, bashfulness and hence are becoming less and less feminine and more and more masculine <laughs> huh? so Allah bless you with a wife who performs her salat she does not miss her salat she protects in her husband's absence what Allah will have her protect. She is righteous. And you are living a happy life. It is as though a piece of heaven has fallen down on earth. Hmm? And Shaitan then launches his attack. Is it time for Azan? Shaitan launches his attack. He comes to you in a dream and shows you your wife in private with another man. And you wake up in the morning and you're not pleased at all. And from your face she could see something is wrong. And you're talking to her in a very harsh way and looking at her. She asks, what's wrong? And this is what I saw last night. Her heart begins to crumble, crumble. <coughs> but she says nothing. One week later, Shaitan comes back. Some of you may have had these dreams. And you now see your wife in bed with another man. And when you wake up, you're at war. A declaration of war. Oh my gosh, you're stamping your foot. You refuse to eat any food. You slam the door when you're leaving the house. And What's going on here? She realizes then you don't trust her anymore. You don't trust her anymore. 
and her heart is now broken broken and by the time you have the third dream the divorce takes place and then shaitan rubs his hand and he says he says mission accomplished mission accomplished because no one ever told you that the Prophet alayhi salatu waslam spoke about dreams from shaitan and how you should respond to them. <coughs> Who is going to call the Azan? Nobody here? Please find out outside. It is a time for the Azan, isn't it? Okay, so go ahead, call the Azan. Bismillah. You can't wait. In India, a hundred years ago or more. And he had dreams and visions. <laughs> so many that they were able to compile a book. <laughs> and in these dreams and visions he was given 95% of the truth that was dazzling. Dazzling. That he could correct all the rest of the ulama. Example, Allah says in Surah Al-Baqarah of the Quran, بَعْلَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ مَا نَنْسَخْ مِنْ آيَةٍ أَوْ نُنْسِهَا نَأْتِ بِخَيْرٍ مِنْهَا أَوْ مِثْلِهَا We do not cancel, we do not abrogate, nor do we cause to be forgotten any ayah any ayah but that we replace it we replace it with that which is better or that which is similar not different not different better or similar because of this verse of the Quran 99% of our scholars came to the conclusion that some verses of the Quran have cancelled and abrogated other verses of the Quran and that some verses of the Quran have been forgotten they are no longer in the Quran when I heard that in the classroom of Tafsir I said to myself because I couldn't say it to the teacher what absolute rubbish can't say that to the teacher huh? what absolute rubbish hmm? when the class was over I went to the scholar my teacher Molana Dr. Muhammad Fadl Rahman Ansari Rahimahullah I said Molana that's what they just taught me in the classroom he said they are wrong and Mirza Ghulam Ahmad said the same thing he said no verse of the Quran has been cancelled and abrogated and if any verse of the Quran and cancel and is cancelled and abrogated, who has the authority to say so? Only, only he who was appointed to teach the Quran. Not Sheikh so and so and Sheikh so and so and Sheikh so and so. Huh? And Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam has never, 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 never declared any verse of the Quran to be cancelled and abrogated. And yet 99% of our scholars hold this belief. Hmm? Uh, Mirza Quran Ahmad declared no verse of the Quran has been cancelled or abrogated. He was right. And on several other issues he was correct. And yet this is a man who was convinced because of the voice who was speaking to him. Shaitan. The Jad. That when Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu waslam said that there is a mujaddid to come at the turn of every century, he was the mujaddid. That when Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu waslam said that Imam al Mahdi is to come, he said, he, I am Imam al Mahdi. That when Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu waslam said that the Messiah will come down, will return, 
the Masih al Maud. He says, I am the Masih al Maud. Forgetting that the Messiah who is to come is the son of Maryam, and he, Mirza, is the son of a Punjabi woman. Huh? <laughs> and finally, that he is a prophet of Allah. <laughs> He is a prophet of Allah. He says there are two kinds of prophets. Full-fledged prophets and part-time prophets. <laughs> he is a part-time one. Zilli <laughs> Nabuwa. So, here is a case of dreams and visions which communicated truth that was dazzling. Dazzling. And yet there was falsehood in it. Like Al Jazeera. <laughs> 95%, you know, like the books of, uh, what's his name, Harun Yahya, 95% so that the 5% of poison can be slipped in. Hmm? So, when you have dreams, to recognize that this dream is from shaitan, you've got to measure this dream with the Quran. If it is in conflict with the Quran, if it is in conflict with the Quran, if it is in conflict with the Sahih Hadith, then you recognize that this could not be the truth. So be careful. Be careful. Because the Jal has a PhD in deception. Now let's go to the third kind of dreams. Namely the dreams from your own nafs. Sometimes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his kindness and compassion chooses to heal this is the do we have any medical doctors here tonight? yes we have two at least two this is the therapeutic value this is medical terminology the therapeutic value of dreams and visions someone is suffering from a broken heart. Did I tell you the story about a little girl? She's only five years of age and in the summertime there are ice cream trucks which come to her town and the ice cream trucks have music and the truck will come after school is over in the afternoon. So on this day the ice cream truck came and the music is being played and all the children in the street are running because it's summertime, it's hot to buy ice cream and she is in her home, she hears the music and she asks her mummy for money my mummy doesn't have any money no so she stands by her window and looks down at the children running to the ice cream truck. She looks down and she sees them buying the ice cream and eating ice cream. She sees them going back to their home and then she sees the ice cream truck drive away and the tears fall from her eyes and that little heart is broken. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a God of Rahmah and even that little heart that is broken he wants to mend it so the heart responds the heart responds with a dream and in the night the ice cream truck came again <laughs> the ice cream truck came again and when she went to mummy 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 ice cream I can I get some money gave her the, the money and she ran down the road and she bought the ice cream all that she wanted and she came back into her house and she sat down and she ate and she ate and she ate and the ice cream was all over her face and all over her clothing and when she woke up in the morning the heart was mended praise be to Allah who uses a dream from the heart to heal the heart and then there was this girl she was just 14 when he married her of course now in the age of Dajjal she has to be 26 
only a fool married at 14. Huh? This is the age of Dajjal. The age of Dajjal. Maryam alayhi salam had just reached the age of puberty. She could no longer live in the temple. And then the angel came to her in the form of a man. And the angel communicated to her the news, you're going to have a baby boy. And she became pregnant. At what age? Not 22, not 24, not 26. She was just turned puberty. So she must have been about 13, 14 for the most. Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha. And the hadith says, Sahih Bukhari, that Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha said that Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam married me when I was six and consummated the marriage when I was nine. That is in manifest conflict with the Quran. Manifest conflict with the Quran. Hmm? <coughs> if ever there was a fabrication, that's a fabrication. No. Aisha radiallahu ta'ala had to have reached the age of puberty for the marriage to take place. And there are many scholars who have done the research, mathematical research, and have published their findings to show it was impossible, impossible for Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha to have been six when that marriage took place. Indeed, no marriage ever took place here on earth. Allah married them. So here are two cases where marriage takes place early, not late. Okay? Uh, and when we build our Muslim village, mashallah, our girls are going to be married very early, very early. So she got married when she was just 14. And he was maybe about 21 or so. And they lived for 50, 60 years together. And they had so much love between them. I don't know whether he had any, more, any other wives, but this one. They were very happy. And when he became an old man, he used to walk with a walking stick. And with the other hand, he'd be holding hands with her and walking in the garden. You ever held hands with your wife and walked? And then he died. And when he died, she was broken. She doesn't eat anymore. No. She can't sleep properly. No. She's just sitting on her rocking chair as though she's in another world not talking to anyone. Her children and her grandchildren are worried. If she continues like this, she'll die. She'll die. And then in the night, he came. He sat beside her on the bed. He held her hands. He talked to her. He joked and laughed with her. He spent the whole night with her. And when she woke up in the morning, look at Granny. What happened? She's so brisk, she's moving, she's washing, she's cleaning, she's in the kitchen. She's giving orders here and there like she used to be before. Something has happened. The dream has come to mend the broken heart, to restore her to a state of health. And praise be to Allah. But before I end, your heart can do something else to you. You see, you have this hat and the bed, and you're quoting Quran and Hadith and Quran and Hadith and Quran and Hadith. And everybody honors you and respect you. Shake, 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 shake. They, when, you, when you come, they want to take picture with you, picture with you, picture with you. So you got the impression that I'm a big man. I am a big man now. I'm a great man. I'm a famous man. So you went to sleep. Now, a long time you didn't have, in this age of progress, you know, you take the toilet and put it inside the house. Uh -huh. 
in this age of progress, you take the toilet, put it inside the house. But in that age, <laughs> when you didn't have this kind of progress, people used to have a latrine at the back of the house. Hmm? Sometimes you had a septic tank or sometimes it's simply you dug a hole. And when it was full, it had to be cleaned. So the structure that was built was movable. Hmm? So you just get two men to move it so the hole is exposed and somebody will have to come with a bucket to come and take out all that stuff inside it. Hmm? The latrine cleaner. So the big sheikh honored and respected everybody wanted his photograph and he saw himself in a dream and this is his profession he has to go to everybody's latrine and clean it that was his heart speaking to him and saying to him that is what the world thinks you are but this is what you really are this is your status the knowledge of his status is communicated to him in a very private way so it does not embarrass him in front of the people it is meant to wake him up you living in fantasy land you better wake up you are misguided you are on the path to destruction and your heart is speaking to you so you better listen to your heart this is why when I wrote my book on dreams in Islam, I said, tell me your dreams and I'll tell you who you are. Hmm? Now finally, if you want to have good dreams and true dreams, what should you do? What should you do? Well, I'm performing my salat, I'm fasting in Ramadan, I'm giving in charity and so on. What else should I do? I recite the Quran, yes. I am not committing zina. I am not drinking fire water, what should I do? Make sure that you take your evening meal early between Asr and Maghrib or immediately after Maghrib. Pakistan usually has dinner at 10 and 11 in the night. So Pakistan has a lot of problems now. <laughs> Nobody has dinner early. So take your dinner early, your evening meal. Do not eat a mountain of food. No. Eat a moderate meal that can be easily digested. And then shortly after Salatul Isha, go to sleep within an hour, an hour and a half of Salatul Isha. But Sheikh, I can't do that. I normally sleep one, two o'clock in the morning. I have to go surfing on the internet. Uh -huh. I have satellite TV, I have this, that. No, 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 no. You come to my home in Gumbak, you won't see a television set. <laughs> I don't buy the daily newspapers. And you live a very nice life, huh? No television and no newspapers. Not even radio. So, go to sleep early. And before you sleep, you make dua. Oh Allah, if you see any good in me, kindly give me a good dream. And if Allah is pleased with you, then Allah can bless you with good dreams. But I would like to suggest that when you make dua to Allah, don't keep anything haram on your person like this piece of bogus and utterly fraudulent and utterly haram paper paper money if Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu waslam were to come today and see this paper money guess what he would say about it if you do that then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may bless you with good dreams and true dreams. Rabbana taqabbal minna innaka anta samir alim wa tu'alina ya mawlana innaka anta tawab rahim. 
برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين آمين Did you read my book on Gog and Magog? You will see where I have consistently restricted myself only to our sources, the Quran and the Hadith, in my eschatology. I'm not unaware of the Christian eschatology, but I choose not, not to use that data in order to preserve my scholarship. I hope and pray there will be others to come after me who will build on what I have built, inshallah and who will then try to compare and contrast our eschatology with theirs, inshallah. Any more questions? Question, good question, good question. Last night, I saw my neighbor's house on fire burning down last night this morning at 10 o'clock fire broke out by 10 30 the fire brigades were there but they could not save it and the house burnt down this is a true dream question how could I see last night that which only occurred at 10 o'clock today? There is no answer from secular scholarship. There is no answer from secular scholarship to that question. The answer can only come from religion. What is the answer? The answer is that events exist before they occur. Innama amruhu idha arada shay'an an yakul lahu kum fayakun. Allah creates events. Having created an event, that event now has to transit the Samawat before it can occur in this world of space and time. As it is passing through that transcendental world, the angel of dream the angel of dream gets knowledge of that event and by Allah's command can communicate it to you which is a true dream the last remaining part of prophethood but when angels speak amongst themselves there's a surah of the Quran called surah to jinn the jinn can eavesdrop and get some knowledge of these events which are to occur and then the jinn can, con can convey that information to human beings which is why President Reagan had one of them in the White House I don't know if you know about that yeah. so, <laughs> so this is how you have the fortune teller and the soothsayer but the information that comes from such a person is unreliable because it's second-hand information that can be inaccurate and can be incomplete. Man ra'a arrafan fasa'alahu min shay'in lam yukbal lahu salatin arba'ina layla said the Prophet If you meet someone who reads your hands and reads the coffee cup, the grains, eh? and for tells fortune telling what's going to happen to you in the future who you're going to get married to how, how many wives you're going to have etc <laughs> Allah's, Allah's messenger said Allah will not accept your salat for 40 days 
And so the true dream, or rather the metaphysics of a true dream, is a very, very important branch of knowledge with which to prove the truth of religion. That the only way, everybody has a true dream sometime, everybody. The only way you can explain a true dream is this way. That there is a world beyond this world. There is an unseen world, Al-Ghaib. The event was, a, was created and it existed in Al-Ghaib. And then there's a surah of the Quran called Surah Al-Ma'arij, which speaks about the event coming down, coming down, stage by stage, until it manifests itself, it occurs in this world. This is the link between dreams and the Samawad. Any other questions? Yes. If I had the time, if I had the time to analyze the dreams in the Quran, I didn't do have that time. This is your homework. You would have seen several true dreams in the Quran. Several. Okay? And when you analyze these dreams, you see that a true dream can communicate news of an event which is to occur in the immediate future. And true dreams can, can, can convey news of events which are to occur in the distant future. True dreams can communicate knowledge of an event which is of direct relationship to you personally. But true dreams can also convey knowledge, news of an event which is of national importance. Like seven years of drought that will con that will affect the entire region and and uh, appropriately so that dream does not come to an ordinary person it comes to the king if you are only getting nonsense in your dreams nothing significant and uh, you wake up you forget everything nothing nothing then Allah does speak about such people. He says they have eyes and yet don't see. They have ears and yet don't hear. They have hearts and yet don't understand. They're just like cattle. They're just like cattle. The difference between cattle and the one who has eyes and yet can see is that Allah puts nur in the heart. But Allah will not put nur into the heart. Yahadillahu li nurihi man yasha. Allah will not put nur in the heart unless that heart qualifies for the nur. That heart must have faith in it. That heart must be polished. That heart must have oil. Yakadu zaituha yudi uwalawlam tamsasuna. The purest oil possible. Olive oil. Hmm? You gotta work for that. You gotta stand up, show backbone. There are those who know they have backbones made of recycled paper. They say, no, I can't do that. I can't say that. If I do that, my business will collapse. If I do that, I won't be able to travel. They put me on a no-fly list. If I do that and speak like that, they go say I'm a terrorist. My friends are gonna part from me. Uh, they might send me Guantanamo. Kulina Solati Wanusuki Wamahiaya Wamamati Lillahi Rabbil Alameen. If you are a people who fast for Allah, Ramadan is coming, then you must be a people who will also live for Allah. Make sense? Those who live for Allah are people who will be willing to die for Allah. Yeah. These are the ones that get noor in their heart. Any more questions?